Okay, guys, so what we're going to do this week and the next week, I mean, I was supposed to teach you in a month of time, but things changed with the schedule because somebody, some of, one of the teachers got sick. Uh, Peter Travni, I think, was supposed to come. So um, I was supposed to teach you in a month time, but I'm very happy to come now and next week. You guys got the schedule. Uh, you have it right. So it might be a little different than what originally was supposed to be. And uh, we're going to learn about um, Hasidic philosophy. That's our topic for these two weeks. And um, I think it's a very exciting topic. It's, uh, I think, going to be a lot of uh, new, uh, might be a lot of new topics that we're going to uh, uh, touch upon. And it will need, uh, I guess, uh, uh, it will demand a lot of uh, um, new ways of looking at different questions that might have bothered you or you might have touched upon in your life. Hasidus, as we call it, I'm not going to say Hasidic philosophy, I would say Hasid Hasidus uh, has a very unique and very special perspective on, um, on life, on existence, on, uh, on basically everything that uh, uh, is part of the human condition. So uh, that's what we're going to learn. Just a few words about myself and why am I uh, teaching you this topic. Uh, I'm a local rabbi, I'm sure most of you might know that. Uh, but for me personally, the reason I mean I come from a non-religious background and then actually a Jewish background but no, with no Jewish identity and the reason why I got caught on to uh, Jewish studies is because of Hasidus, is because of Hasidic philosophy, because I found it so deep and so uh, um, uh, motivating, and I still do find it that way till today. And so that's why I thought that would be some a topic that I would love to share with you the most. Although I'm a rabbi, I also have a PhD in history, so it was a little bit uh, a, a dilemma, so-called, if uh, to to teach you. Uh, Hasidus, Hasidic philosophy, or to teach you Hungarian or Eastern European uh, 19th century Jewish history. But I got, when I thought about spending two weeks with you guys, I thought to myself, maybe it might be more exciting for me to take Hasidus and uh, Hasidic philosophy. So that's why we chose this topic. Now, um, I, what I'm going to do now is just in the first hour today, uh, maybe not even an hour, just 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I will try to give you a, a general overview just before we jump into the deep water, um, a general overview what really Hasidus is, that you should be able to place it more or less historically and, uh, and uh, ideologically into your, uh, uh, um, into your, into your mind. Uh, but I'm not going to dwell on it too long, and, and I'm, this is also not a course about, Jew, uh, about Hasidus, uh, the history of Hasidism. Uh, it's, uh, you can, and, and, I'm, uh, and I'm also not a professor in, in, in the history of Hasidism. Uh, we will learn a lot of topics that Hasidic philosophy teaches, uh, speaks about, but we're not going to learn too much about who the people are who's, who wrote these, these ideas, in what circumstances did they write these ideas, uh, but we're gonna get really a good taste of what they said, what they have said. So uh, I guess let's start. If you guys are ready, and just in general, I mean, I, I, I will. We will have a text. I printed out a whole book for you, uh, practically a text that we're gonna go through. Hopefully, we will learn also a lot of the text inside uh, in these classes. But uh, I will just many times maybe go on speaking or write on the on blackboard. Uh, but I, I would really love if you guys have any questions, if you feel that you don't understand something, obviously it could be more of a uh, interactive type of uh, discussion. So please don't feel uh, intimidated. And if you want to ask something, you have something is not clear, then you should always ask. As the Talmud says, Lo habay shan lomed. Somebody who is embarrassed is not going to be able to learn. So if you have a question, then please feel free. 
So first, let's just really give a, a short introduction about Hasidic Hasidism. What is really Hasidism all about, and how it connects to uh, to uh, Eastern European or European uh, and in today already general Jewish history. So, as we all know, Hasidism was founded by a man whose name was Yisrael ben Eliezer. Uh, back in those days, obviously, people don't even have in Eastern Europe a family name. So Yisrael, the son of Eliezer. And uh, he was, uh, uh, he became an uh, orphan at, at relatively a young age. He was born in 1698. So we're speaking about roughly over 300 years ago uh, in the Ukraine, Poland, uh, area of Europe, uh, and uh, his name Yisrael Ben Eliezer, he became more famous by the name of the Baal Shem Tov, because later on they gave him the name Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, the Israel, the holder of the good name. This uh, term of the holder of the good name refers, to, the good name refers to the name of God, and the holder of the, uh, the good name is a person who is a godly person, a saint, uh, somebody who is a righteous person. And it was used already from the time of the Talmud for people that were considered righteous people. Especially at those times, you had many people, at this, I'm mean, speaking God in the time of the 17th, 18th century, you had many people that their name was Baal Shem Tov, but it's still today, generally when we refer to the Baal Shem Tov, or in the short, or in the short term, the Besht, B-E-S-H-T, or in Hebrew, do you guys know how to write, read Hebrew? Bet Ein Shin Tet. Uh, that is uh, that is the Baal Shem Tov. When we refer to a person with that name, that's usually Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidic uh, uh, of the Hasidic movement. So it's very interesting because there is a, there is a famous um, there's a famous anecdote about um, about who this person was and the relevance of him being born into this world, and this has to do with the idea of the name, his name, and the idea of the holder of the good name. Uh, the story goes that there is a famous saying, I think it originates from the Talmud, where the Talmud says, if somebody faints, how do you wake him up if somebody faints? So there's different ways, you know, you can, you can try to kick him, you can try to shake him up, you could try to uh, pour a, uh, a buckle of uh, cold water on his face, but the Talmud says there's one way you can you can definitely wake him up, and that is if you uh, whisper his own name into his ears. And with that, somehow his soul comes back to his body. Because being uh, a person who fainted uh, is uh, basically just like a little bit of just the same phenomena as dying. Your soul leaves your body. Uh, and with calling your name into your ears, brings back your soul to your body. Uh, this idea of the name being uh, representing the idea of the soul dwelling in the body is in Jewish practice, it's pretty well known, as you might know that we say that when a baby gets his Jewish name, his or her Jewish name, that is the time when actually the soul finally gets into the body and dwells in the body. Uh, so the same way it is, with a baby who just gets the Jewish name for the first time, the same way when a person uh, gets whispered his Jewish, his Jewish name into his ears, that will make him up, wake him up from fainting. And the Hasidic anecdote says that at that time, when the Jewish people, uh, when Baal Shem Tov was born into the Jewish community in Eastern Europe, the Jews who were mainly, or at least, uh, uh, a, a big part of the Jewish community then was living in Europe, was really in a, a general state of fainting. Uh, the Jewish people were relatively very, very poor. They were, uh, they were in, uh, living in Christian Europe where they had, didn't have any rights. Their existence was very shaky. They could be uh, expelled any day from the place they lived. Uh, so in the physical terms, Jews were, were really, really on the, on, on, the, on the edge of existence. And when it comes to spirituality, you might think, oh, well, at least spiritually, they were really, very well off. 
The truth is, Jews at that time were also spiritually at really at a, at a low, uh, we could might say one of the all-time lows of uh, European Jewish history. Well, let's place why. What, what was the situation then? First of all, because of the the financial situation of the Jewish people, most of the Jews uh, in Europe didn't have a chance to study the Torah and didn't have a chance to uh, get any education. Uh, uh, education costed money and back in those days there were no organized yeshivot in uh, Europe. This idea of modern yeshiva systems, you know, of Talmudic schools uh, started just at the more of the 17th, 18th uh, century. Uh, there was no yeshivot, organized yeshiva schools. Um, most of the Jews were actually very unlearned and un, uh, and and uh, didn't have a chance to study. There was a small minority of people that that were better well off and they had the chance to teach their children. Uh, and basically, all, we could almost say that Jews happened to break up the two castes. The Jewish people broke up the caste is the word, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, uh, in Hungarian, that's how you say cost, but I guess that's the, is that the word in English as well, but we have a teacher here that can help us. So it, was, it broke up the two castes. The more uh, learned, more financially well-off part of the people and the less learned and, uh, and, and financially devastated uh, group. Um, besides this, I'm sure you're aware of and you know the story of um, of, uh, of Shabtai Tzvi, who was uh, one of the, the one of the famous failed messiahs of uh, the Jewish people. Uh, who was actually not an Ashkenazi Jew, so his place would not be in Ashkenazium uh, in our school. He was a Jew from uh, from Turkey, but uh, he. Uh, with his false, uh, false Jew, uh, messianic identity, got a lot of uh, Ashkenazi followers in Europe, and these people are really hoping that they would, you know, this guy would end their sufferings. And when it turned out that he, when he was confronted by the Sultan, he changed his religion. That really got these people even more devastated. I don't know if you guys, one of my favorite uh, writers. Is uh, Isha, uh, Isaac Bashevi Zinger, and uh, he has a he has a very nice, a beautiful book, which in uh, I guess in English would be the Satan in Gorain. Uh, if you didn't read it in Hungarian, it's called Shatan Gorainban. If you didn't read this book, you should read it. It's an unbelievable book. It's it, it basically plays out this story um, in a in a beautiful novel. So this is a time when Jewish people are like fainted and they are really devastated. And then what happens? God brings this soul down to earth and uh, the uh, Israel, the little Israel, whose name is Israel, is the same name as of the Jewish people. And by God making this little boy being born into this world, he's actually whispering the Jewish people's name into their own ears. So he's trying to wake them up from their devastation and from their status of being fainted and, uh, and giving them a new strength, a new revival uh, to, uh, to Jewish practice, to Torah study, and so on and so forth. So this is actually, if we look on a historical uh, um, uh, 300 time period, we see that Hasidic uh, philosophy and Hasidic uh, uh, movement really changed religious Judaism forever. So today, even groups that are not Hasidic groups today, uh, what we, call, we would call them, let's say, Litvish or modern Orthodox or even non-Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, their way of um, hashkafa, their way of uh, worldview and their way of Jewish practice is way, way closer to Hasidism what they would imagine. So when it comes to their practice, the way of them understanding what godliness is, what the uh, significance of Jewish practice and the mitzvot, the, the commandments of the Torah, the c- significance of Torah study, uh, all the major ideas of Hasidic philosophy, at least on a, uh, how you say, like a superficial. superficial level, really went down to all streams of religious Judaism. 
So it's, it really changed religious Judaism, I would say, uh, altogether. So, but Israel Baal Shem Tov was a major figure, and he's the founder of Hasidic thought and Hasidic uh, movement. He didn't write any books, though. So we don't have really many books from the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, there is a few collections of his teachings, mainly in books of his students or the students of his students. Um, but his teachings were always said in a very short and uh, verbal form. Um, there is certain letters that the Baal Shem Tov wrote that are quoted many times, or certain sh small, very short uh, notes, and those are bas basically uh, co collected in a book called Tzavat Haribash. So this turns off if you don't use it. It's not, it's not very good. Uh, if you connect it to your computer, it'll uh, stay on while your computer is yeah. on. Yeah, because I like writing on it, you know, and do you guys write on it or, uh, or uh, more connected to the computer? Okay, so. So, so we are speaking about the Baal Shem Tov. I just want to write down the name, his full name, he would go like this, Baal Shem Tov. In short, we just call him Besht. You know, this is the acronym of his Hebrew name. And the major work that is his, uh, uh, the collection of his uh, uh, teachings is called Sabbat. Haribash. Ribash stands for Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. And Sava means Vegandla. Uh, Do you say Vegandla in English? Testimony. Testimony. Uh, of the of of the Israel uh, Baal Shem Tov, but really when we speak about the teachings of Baal Shem Tov, most of his teachings are just either short uh, explanations of different parts of the sto of, of Torah verses, or stories, mainly stories of the Baal Shem Tov. So a story of the Baal Shem Tov is not just about his miraculous uh, practice. Uh, and different miracles that he was able to do or accomplish, but it's much more about that certain message that is there in the story. So if you will have time, maybe we'll speak about some stories and try to explain them and what the major message of each story is. But there is huge collections of Hasidic stories, uh, even by modern writers. Most famous is uh, Martin Buber, that you can uh, uh, read his books in English, in Hungarian. Um, um, and those stories are always about, not just about a miracle, but about what we can learn from this study, uh, from the stories. So that's the Baal Shem Tov. Now the Baal Shem Tov, unlike most Hasidic teachers later on, was not situated, or was not famous for being situated in one place. You know, most of Hasidic streams, or we would call, call them Hatserot, most of the Hasidic, uh, um, uh, um, how do you call that? Udvar? In the court? Yeah. Uh, dynasties? Yeah. Dynasties, or in Hungarian we'd call it like Hasid Udvar Tartas, or Hasid Udvarok. But in the dynasty, dynasty would be the best. So most Hasidic dynasties are uh, related to a certain name of a town, like Lubavitch dynasty, or Satmar dynasty, or Gur. Or bells. The Baal Shem Tov was a traveling rabbi. So he was, although uh, much of his time he lived in Mezhibush, uh, which is a town probably in Ukraine today, he, he didn't situate himself in one place. He didn't hold a huge uh, household. 
uh, where Hasidim would come and would visit him, he would go out and visit town after town. Most of the Hasidic stories of the Baal Shem Tov are about him going from place to place to visit uh, different Jews and really bringing the message of, of wake up, guys. You know, so it's it, this connects to the to our first anecdote of him being the wake up call for the Jewish people. Um, so he had many students, and I would say he had first of all a lot of followers between the simple people, between the simple caste of the Jewish people at the time. But slowly, he also got many major, very learned and very uh, 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 well st uh, studied followers as well, rabbis, that themselves became, at the next generation, um, major uh, Hasidic rabbis themselves, or rabbis themselves. So many, some of those rabbis were, were and we would call them the second generation of, uh, of Hasidic rabbis, we would call them uh, just um, uh, um, individual Rabbis, so they didn't continue. They didn't have a dynasty uh, where they, they where they continued um, to have children and their sons and their children going after them and having a certain way of thought that was taken from generation to generation. Some of those rabbis had children and grandchildren, and great grandchildren, and they had a full Hasidic dynasty of their family, mostly uh, that would take their teachings and and continue it on generation after generation. So um, the first generation of, of, I called it second generation before, but let's call them now for the sake of, the, uh, of our learning today, the first generation of uh, these, um, uh, these rabbis included famous rabbis like uh, the Choyz de Milublin, the, uh, the, how would you say that, Latnok, in, in English, prophet. it's uh, not a really a prophet, but uh, somebody who sees uh, the a seer, a seer. A what? The clairvoyant, like the French one. Uh huh. Maybe. The seer? Can you say that? Maybe. Somebody that sees yeah. far, uh, from Lublin. Uh, then, uh, for example, or the Nachman, uh, the Breslev and Rav Nachman, uh, or. Uh, Probably one of the most famous is the Magid from Mizrich. Uh, Magid from Mizrich, who uh, was, we would call him the, um, pre, uh, how you say, uh, Utod, the, the, the successor, the successor yeah, of, of, Baal Shem, of the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, and he was already situated in Mizrich. So unlike, uh, unlike the Baal Shem Tov, who was a traveling rabbi, he was in one place, in Mizrich, and the students and followers all came to him, not him going to uh, others. For example, from the Magid Mizrich, we have already many books. Um, most famous, let's say, is uh, Kedusha Salevi, uh, which is also translated to English. You have uh, uh, Magid Vorav Leyakov, other other texts. Those are mostly texts or uh, explanation, Torah explanations that are based on the text of the Bible, and uh, and basically we can say that he uh, institutionalized something which later on in most Hasidic courts continued is that uh, they would uh, most Hasidic dynasties that the Rebbe, the leader of the dynasty or the leader of the Hasidic group would give his teachings based on the Torah studies of the weekly Torah portion or of the holiday that uh, that came. So that's that's nothing new because learning and and finding the actual uh, actualities of the weekly Torah portion is a Jewish custom for 3,000 years but it's very typical since Hasidism that the, the, the leading rabbi would, would give his, his philosophic, sometimes very deep philosophic ideas, sometimes philosophic ideas that have nothing to do with uh, actually the Torah portion itself, but still base it on the Torah portion. And this is something that would be different than other Torah studies or other Torah 
the commentaries that we have from before. So if you look in the Middle Ages, we have major, even philosophical uh, uh, Torah commentaries. Let's take, for example, Da Barbanel, Rabbi Yitzchak Barbanel, who was a Portuguese and uh, Italian uh, commenter, and who was also a major philosopher. I don't know if you guys ever came across his uh, teachings. So he, for example, would take the Torah portion and write his commentary on the Torah in a way that he would ask, take one story, ask like 15, 20 questions, and then go into really deep explanations where he would explain, try to explain even sometimes on many levels, the answer to those questions. And meanwhile, he would go into a lot of deep philosophical discussion. But at the end of the day, the purpose of his uh, studies would be to explain us what the Torah is telling us here, what, what is behind the simple text of the Torah. Uh, what we find in many Hasidic teachings is that the question that we start off from uh, when, we, when we would speak about the Torah portion or take one verse of the Torah portion is just what they would call in Yiddish the passport from the Maimer. It's just a passport in order to start a discussion. And then you really get into some deep stuff that has practically almost nothing to do with with the question and the answer, you might come back to the answer at the end of the day, just not to leave you with the question, but meanwhile, you're opened up to a whole world that has nothing to do with the Torah portion. So it's a, but we still want to stick to a certain verse in the Torah and not just start to speak out of nowhere. Uh, so that's why most Hasidic books, not all, for example, the book that we're going to study is not like that, but most Hasidic books are based on the Torah. So you will find them per portion by portion, a certain portion of their philosophy. So that's how the way, for example, the Magid, the Mezritche Magid, uh, works also. His book, the Kedusha Salevi, is based on the Torah and the portions of Torah uh, being explained. Now, we will get now to the third generation. And the third generation, and this is the most important thing, which we will talk as a as an as a introduction to our studies today and this whole two weeks. The third generation of Hasidic philosophy, Hasidism had already hundreds of thousands of followers, um, but at least tens of thousands. It became a major movement in, uh, in, in, in Judaism. We're speaking now uh, already towards... Um, um, the middle of the 18th century, towards the second half of the 18th century. And, uh, and uh, no, sorry. Uh, middle of the 18th century, let's say. Not, not so much the end of the 18th century. Okay, so, and um, there was a major argument between the stu students of the Mezitsche Magid. And the argument was, which way should we take the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov? Should we go in the way of Chabad or the way of Chagas? What is these two words? So we'll write it down in Hebrew. Again, we have acronyms. So we have Chabad or Chagas. These three, two words are actually six words. So Chabad is an acronym of Chochmah, Bina, and Dat, which is, stands for wisdom, understanding, sorry, and um, knowledge. Or Chagas. Chagas stands for Chesed, Gura, and Tiferes. Chesed is kindness. Gura is uh, Sigur. How do you say Sigur? Arwur um, Isham. Um, Arwur Isham. Strict. Strictness, okay. Strictness. There's many ways to, uh, to, to translate this. Tiferes literally means beauty. You, how do you spell beauty? Beauty. 
V U V E A U. See, like this. Uh, beauty, there's no I, I'm sorry. Uh, beauty, but uh, indeed we would call it Konyadulat. Uh, How do you say Konyadulat in English? Rahamim. Rahamim, yeah. Uh, mercy, 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 mercy. So, uh, so the question was do we go in the Chabad way or do we go in the Hagas way? What is really the difference? So it's not about do we go in the ways of understanding or do we go in the ways of kindness, strictness, and mercy? What does that mean? Actually, these two uh, uh, phenomena are well-known Kabbalistic terms. And uh, obviously, we're going to be using a lot of Kabbalistic terms because, as we will learn in a second, uh, uh, Hasidic philosophy is much based on Kabbal, on uh, Kabbalistic uh, ideas. But basically, the question was as follows. When we said that the Baal Shem Tov, I, I will give a little longer introduction and we'll go, get back to what this means, what the argument was. But when we, let's get back to our story when we said that the Baal Shem Tov was the wake-up call for the Jewish people. How did he wake up the Jewish people? With what? Okay, he was the name being whispered into the Jewish people's ears. Okay, but what does that mean? How did he... Uh, revive the Jewish people? How did, he, how did he give them enthusiasm? So basically the Baal Shem Tov said, we have to go down. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Just be careful, uh, Vidyaza. Ah, on the internet? Yeah. Because I'm safe. Yes, yes. It's complicated. Okay. So basically the Baal Shem Tov said, in order to, to give life, you have to go down to the level of the soul. You have to wake up the soul. In order to wake up the soul, we have to give the soul of the Torah. It's an ancient philosophic idea that everything has a body and a soul, right? Even unliving creatures have a body and a soul. In simple terms, the body is the surface and the soul is the inner meaning. So the same way everything has a soul, the Torah itself has a soul and a body. The body of the Torah is the practical meaning of the Torah. For example, most of the Talmud or Halakha is how to act, what to do. It's more the surface side of the Torah. So this is like the body of the Torah. In order to wake up the soul of the Jewish people, we need to find and reveal the soul of the Torah. So you can heal the soul with the soul, right? Um, what is the soul of the Torah? The soul of the Torah is the mystical inner meaning of the Torah. And the mystical inner meaning of the Torah is in the Kabbalah, mostly in the Kabbalistic teachers, um, teachings. So obviously throughout the ages, you always had parts of the Torah which were more practical and parts of the Torah which were more philosophical, right? Even in the Torah itself, or the Tanakh itself, you have parts which speak about what are the animals that you're allowed to eat and what are the animals you're not allowed to eat, which is a more of a practical, uh, uh, um, a, 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 a practical question. And you have more philosophical questions. For example, when it speaks about the creation of the world or when uh, we have uh, Moses debating God about whether or not he's able to see his essence. So it's a philosophical discussion. But if you look also at the commentaries, you have parts of the, Tor of the Talmud, for example, that has more practical uh, parts. And there is the Midrash, where we speak about different, more lofty uh, philosophical questions of afterlife or things like that. And throughout the ages, you always had these two parts of the Torah, which we would call the Nigile Shebet Torah and the Nistar Shebet Torah. We'll get back to this in a second. Let's just let this light dry down these two, two uh, parts. So we have the Torah, which has Nigle, the revealed part, and we have the Nistar. The Nistar is the hidden part. Why do we call it revealed and hidden? Because just like body and soul, when I look at a person, now, obviously, I look at him as a person, as a, as a person as a whole. I'm looking at him 
as body and soul together. But still, what is the revealed part of him? What, what is my first impression about his body? Does he have a nice body or not so nice, or even nicer body? But uh, I don't see the soul. The soul is something which is hidden uh, and um, it will take time to reveal his soul. And sometimes I, don't, I will never get to see or get to know his soul altogether or I won't get to know it fully. Um, so too in the Torah, you have the revealed part, which is practice. It's a simple question with an answer of yes or no. Can I do this on Shabbat or can I, can I not do this on Shabbat? This is a practical question that needs to have a yes or no answer. It cannot be like, well, it has to be practical. When it gets to the other side of the Torah, what is the meaning of this, of, of this practice on Shabbat? Well, that's hidden. Why? Because it's just like the soul. It could have many meanings. Maybe this is the meaning, but in a deeper level, this is the meaning. And in an even more deeper level, this is the meaning. So it's not a yes or no question. It's a question of, of a deeper understanding. So you always have in the Torah these two parts. And one, and this hidden part has many sub, um, sub um, um, categories as well. And one of the major categories to this is what we call Kabbalah. Right? Everybody heard about Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah? The word Kabbalah, what does it mean? Do you know what it means? To receive something. Why? Because we receive it in a tradition. It's a tradition. So Kabbalah is really not just a philosophical mean, meaning of the Torah, but it's a, uh, a tradition of mystical philosophy. What, and just as a side note, so we should understand what's the significance of this. What is the difference between philosophy and mystical philosophy? What does that mean? What is, what is mystical philosophy mean? Well, actually, it's really a, um, a contradiction. It's either philosophy or, mystic, uh, or mysticism, right? Why? Because philosophy is based on cognitive understanding. What, do you, what does a philosopher do? He sits around the world, he sees what's going on, and he starts thinking, well, this is like this because this, and, and he makes one and two and two is four, four and four is eight. He builds up a whole worldview based on his contemplation. It's a cognitive contemplation. Mysticism is just mystical stuff. It says if you do this and this and this, this and this will happen. Or the meaning of this is this and this code. Uh, it's not something philosophical. So how can you have a mystical philosophy? What Kabbalah is, is a mystical philosophy, which means there's a tradition of some mystical meanings of the world, mystical meanings of the Torah, mystical meanings of some soul matters, but it's also a philosophy. It has an explanation. It's not just well, this is the way it is, accept it or, or, or not. And so Kabbalah was something which was part of the Torah study. But as you all know, Kabbalah was, a, as it says here, is a hidden part of the Torah. Just a very minor group of people studied it. So much so that we read in the Talmud that there were very few people that actually were able to study Kabbalah and didn't go cuckoo or didn't die, or didn't leave Judaism, because it's so deep and, 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 and so um, unreachable that the Talmud has a whole story about different sages that went into the uh, paradise, that went into the Ligat, how you say, the... Grove. The what? Grove, Ligat. Ligat? Yeah. Grove. Grove of, of mystical thought, and they either got lost, or they died, or they left Jewish uh, practice. And it's very hard to keep yourself with it because it's, it's like a drug, you know? You take it, you, it's very hard to take drug on a, just the right level. So um, throughout the ages, Kabbalah was just for a very minor part of the community. It wasn't for most people. It wasn't even for most rabbis. What did the Baal Shem Tov say? In all his teaching, he referred to Kabbalah, Kabbalistic ideas, okay? But even just on a simple level, give you an example, Kabbalistic idea. One of the major teachings of the Baal Shem Tov was about uh, divine providence. The idea that nothing happens by chance, that everything is part of a godly, a godly um, plan. Well, this is 
many of the stories, in many of the stories of the Baal Shem Tov, this is a returning uh, idea. And later generations explain this in real depth, what the Baal Shem Tov meant by this. But this is a really problematic philosophical idea because if everything is part, part of divine providence, then where is my free choice in the story? Yeah, this is one of the major questions of, of Jewish philosophy and not just for Jewish philosophy. Well, how do you cope divine providence, deterministic divine providence with free choice? But the Baal Shem Tov, just on a simple level, he used this idea to make people, even simple people understand, look, even if your fate is really terrible, don't worry because this is part of the big plan. So he gave them a, a new life and, an, and some type of belief or faith that their fate is not just by chance and this gave them strength to go through whatever they had to go through. Uh, but if you dwell more deep into this stuff, it's going to become really Kabbalistic and really mystical. It might mix you up uh, in a big major way. So this is what happened. We're going to get back to our original uh, idea here. So this is what happened here. The question was, where do we take these studies of the Baal Shem Tov, these teachings of the Baal Shem Tov? Do we keep them on a simpler level, at least for the simple people, and put an emphasis on the enthusiasm that can come from such deep teachings, but without really taking hell of a lot of this drug, or do we take it all away? That's the, that's the question. So let me give you a, just a, a little anecdote. So, you know, uh, uh, for example, my mom, who I really love, she uh, many times, when we laugh at her because when she sits in a crowd and somebody says a joke, we say he laughs, she laughs twice. She laughs once when everybody else laughs, and a few seconds later she laughs when she hops the joke, when she realizes what the, what the joke was. Now, why does she laugh the first time when she just laughs with everybody together? Not because she's faking the laugh and she would be embarrassed not to laugh, because she's having fun, everybody's having fun, so she's gonna have fun too, right? It's a good atmosphere. So that might happen with you also many times. Somebody says a stupid joke, you don't think it's that funny, but when everybody laughs, you say, oh, it's, 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 a, it's a good environment, so you're gonna start laughing laugh uh, as well, right? Uh, and sometimes you laugh because you think it's a very funny joke. Sometimes, I really like jokes, and sometimes I think of a joke that I heard like three days ago, and I start laughing on my own without saying, even saying it, and my wife thinks that I'm nuts. I just sit in the car and suddenly start laughing. What are you laughing at? I just reminded myself of a joke. Uh, well, if you have a deep understanding of the joke, you will laugh even if you don't say it. It becomes part of you. So the question is, what is which type of happiness should we go for? Should we go for the happiness which is more... Um, what was the word you used? Superficial. Superficial. But everybody can reach it, right? So anybody can get into a crowd and if he, even if he doesn't stand the jokes, if everybody is laughing, he's going to start having fun too. Do we do it this way? Or do we do it in a way that we should all try to understand the jokes and have fun on a real way and not just because everybody's having fun. Now, what does that have to do with us? When we speak about Hasidic uh, teachings, so the, the second group said, which is the Hagas group, uh, this group, they said, look, these teachings are extremely deep, very hard to understand. Most simple people cannot understand them. And if we will give it to them, we will go through the same problem that our earlier generations went through, that these people will not able to appreciate what they're learning. So either they won't appreciate it or they will understand it in the wrong way. It's gonna go off, it's just gonna, it's not gonna work. So what is the solution? Let's take the Rebbe. He's the leader of the group. He will learn his studies. It will really give him an inner real enthusiasm and people that will be standing around him and will follow his ways, they will get enthusiastic as well. So the tzaddik, the righteous person, the leader of the group, he's our role model. If we see that he prays with such enthusiasm, we all start praying with such enthusiasm. Do you know that uh, uh, Yiddish song, as the Rebbe zing, as the Rebbe zing, 
Zingen ale chasidim, da 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 It's a famous klezmer song, yeah? And then he goes, as the Rebbe danced, as the Rebbe danced, danced, and ale chasidim, as the Rebbe schlofft, as the Rebbe schlofft, schlofft. So the chasidim in this song are like these puppets, you know, like, they go after the Rebbe. The Rebbe does it, we do it too. The Rebbe does it, we do it too. Why? Because the Rebbe is so enthusiastic and so, like, he grasps you with all his uh, way of acting. So we look at the Rebbe and whatever the Rebbe does, we do. This is, um, there, there's, I think, a psalm which says, Tzadik Bemunato Yichye. A righteous person in his faith will live. So this Hasidic group said, don't read it Yich, yeah, but read it Ye Chaye. This would mean live. This would mean will make others live. So the tzaddik, the righteous person, with the way of his faith, will make other persons live. So it, if we tap onto his enthusiasm, we will be enthusiastic ourselves. Ourselves, Although we don't understand the joke, he laughs, so we will laugh too. So that was the idea of the first, or this group, the Chagas group. Let the Rebbe read it. Let the Rebbe contemplate, let the Rebbe understand. He will get enthusiastic, and through this, his followers will get enthusiastic. This is the meaning of Chagas. Chagas is the first, first three levels in Kabbalah, Kabbalistic teachings of the fir first three attributes of emotions. So it's the kindness, strictness, and mercy is the general term for th their acronym. Hagas is the general term for emotions. So this group said, you know, let's just focus for the large group, let's just focus on emotions. Let people not get too much dwelled into cognitive stuff, they will get lost. Let the Rebbe do that, or the leaders of the community do that, and we will follow them and the emotions will come through. That's what they said. What did the other group say? The Chabad group said, no, 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 no. this is very superficial. It's just very, uh, it's, it's not an inner way of doing it. Let's do it all the way. So let's focus on Chochmah Bina Dat, which is the first three levels in Kabbalistic terms, the first or the three levels of uh, intellect. So this Chabad means practically intellect. It's two L's, intellect? Yes. Intellect. And uh, they said, if we want to bring enthusiasm to the group, we cannot be just uh, relying on us understanding it and just giving over the, uh, um, the enthusiasm that comes from the understanding. We have to give over the understanding itself. And for that, you said there is a problem, Kabbalah, it's too high, it's ungraspable. Well, this is our job. Let's make it understandable. So let's give it over in a way that even simpler people will be able to understand it. So let's take the topics of Kabbalah and take them apart in a way with such language, with such explanation, in length, in depth, that even simpler people will understand it. And this was a huge argument. Which way do we go? And actually, most of the Hasidic groups went the second way, Hagas, Hagas way. There was practically, at that time, only one group that said, only one rabbi, one student of the Mezid Shemagid, who said, let's go the first way, the Chabad way. And that student was uh, Schneor Zalman from Liozna, and then later Liadi, uh, Schneer Zalman, um, who was a, a very, very uh, knowledgeable student of the Magid from Mezrich, and he said, we got to go this Chabad way. Um, so, actually, his name might be familiar, because Schneer is... Uh, pri is a is a is a private name. I say a 
Keres név? A given name. But later on, one generation later, this became a family name, Schneur Son, right? Because at that time, in the, the Russia, uh, the Tsar made all people to have last names. Is Schneur uh, Yiddish? Uh, no, it's in Hebrew. It's Hebrew. Schneur means, Schneur means two lights. Schne or two lights. Schneur. Um, actually, they say that he, had, he, he later became like his name because he had two major works. He had many books, but two major works. One just like two lights. One in Nikola and one in Nistar, the way we wrote it. One in the revealed part of the Torah and one in the hidden part of the Torah. One was the Shulchan Aruch, which he wrote, rewrote a simpler Shulchan Aruch, uh, book of Jewish law. And the other is the Tanya, which is the major book of, uh, of Hasidic teaching, of Chabad Hasidic teaching. So anyways, he said like this, you know, you have a claim. You say that this, there's a story with him and you'll, you understand with, with the story, you'll understand what we're saying. This was a, such a huge fight that, uh, before we get into the story, so just understand the context, the fight was basically like, n n the way Hasidic stories tell over the story is that this fight was not only here down on our level, but even in the heavens, this was a huge fight. Even on the spiritual realms, this was a fight. Do we let the Kabbalistic teachings out of the hands of the few and make it accessible to all? Do we do that? Or is that um, um, uh, something which would hurt the dignity of uh, this very special part of the Torah? Um, so Rabbi Schneer Salman has even a story that um, one time he was in the synagogue of his, uh, I'm not sure about the per people, I'm sorry, who, who the, the people that the story is with, but one time he was in the, I think the synagogue of his teacher, the Mezit Shemagid, and they found a paper on the, on the floor with some Kabbalistic and Hasidic teachings. And another student really went, Zook, he was, went crazy. These holy teachings and they're just on the floor. Look, this is what happens when these, you take these holy teachings and make it accessible to people that are not up to it, that are not on the level to able to appreciate it. And he said, wait, 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 let me tell you a story. I think we should still do it because let me tell you a story. And he said a story like this. You know, there was once a king who had an only son. You know the story? <laughs> once a king, all the story starts like this. Once there was once a king that had an only son, and this son became very sick, and all from the whole world, different uh, um, um, uh, doctors came and were looking for some type of treatment that they can heal this little kid, and nothing worked. And finally, one doctor came and said, "Look, the son was almost dead already." And this doctor said, "Look, I, there is one way of." treating this son of yours, but I'm afraid to tell you what it is. Why? Because it involves your holy crown and the most precious stone of diamond on your crown. Uh, what happens? So he says, well, you have to take this diamond that you have to grind it and grind up the whole diamond, which costs billions of dollars, and you have to put it into water and you have to make the, your son drink from it. And when he will drink from it, uh, most of the water will go on the side. It won't go into his mouth and he won't be able to swallow it. But even if he swallows just one tiny drop of this mixture of grinded uh, precious stone and, your, and the water, it might heal him. So he said the same thing is true for us. Look at the Jewish people. They are like half dead. They are closer to dead than to alive. What do we do? We take the most precious stone of the holiest crown of God, which is the Torah. The most precious stone on this crown is the Kabbalistic teachings. We grind them up, we mix it with water, which means we make it accessible to all. We pour it into this kid's mouth. Most of it will go on the side. Many things will happen to this that should not happen. Many situations of uh, undignifying and un... Uh, um, uh, unfitted situations will happen. But even in just a small, tiny drop of the teaching, 
will go into this kid's mouth, this will be helpful and he will be able to live. So this is why I say, he said, Rabbi Shneur Salman, we should do it this way. We should try to give the explanation of these deep, deep uh, topics to be accessible for all. Uh, and he had, by the way, another, there's two, two major uh, and uh, two major metaphors or stories that uh, uh, Rabbi Shneur Zama said. This is one of them. Another one is about um, is about uh, the Messiah. The idea that if the Messiah comes, so um, no, I'm sorry. There's another. There's another. Uh, there's another story about if if you don't you if you don't heat your house when, house when it's warm outside. It doesn't mean you should not hit your house when it's freezing cold outside. So what does that metaphor work stand for? Why do you need the Kabbalistic teachings now? For 2,000 years we were not, or 3,000 years we were not using them and not making it accessible to all people. Why should you do it now? He said, well, it was warm then. Now it's cold. What did he mean by this? He meant to say that today there is a, a major new uh, ruach, a major new... Uh, uh, Salem. Uh, mm. spirit going through the world and this spirit is of the enlightenment and of secular secularity as is, is, is there such a word I don't know secular secular uh, spirit and this is really really dangerous for our people so we have to give them something to stand up against it to give them strength against this secular wave of, of, of which will bring them to assimilation. So it's dark outside and cold. So a thousand years ago, we didn't need this, this special uh, means because it was warm outside. Everybody believed in God. Everybody, it was all clear. It was no questions. Today is the time of a new age where cognitive intellectual ideas will suddenly come to surface and will be accessible to all. We have to give the Ellen said, we have to give the, the antidote. antidote to this uh, in the Jewish way. And that is the Kabbalistic thought and the Jewish uh, and, the, and, and the Hasidic uh, uh, philosophy. And then there's a third explanation why. And that is, you know, when it's really, really dark during the night, the coldest part of the night, when is that? At the end of the night. And it's just right before dawn, is that the word? Hoina? Right before dawn, before the sunlight comes up and it becomes warmer. We are at the end of the days. We are at the end of the days of the spiritual galut, um, spiritual um, exile. And redemption is really coming close. Messiah will soon come. And when Messiah will come, the light will go up. And when we get to closer to the Messiah, we need to have a little taste of what we will be seeing then. Just like before Shabbat, you taste a little bit of the food of Shabbat. Everybody likes eating chund uh, just before Sholat, before uh, Shabbat. So too, we need to taste a little bit of these deep teachings. So when Messiah comes, we will have a little clue of what's flying. There is, by the way, a, a nice uh, Hasidic... Uh, anecdote that says, um, you know why we learn this Hasidic stuff, this Hasidic philosophy, although we don't fully understand everything, it's because of the aha. What? It's because of the aha. Because what will happen? The Messiah will come, all these Kabbalistic terms and attributes will be seen with our physical eyes. But if we don't know what they are, we'll just be looking at them like, gaze at them and like, don't understand what's flying. But if we learned a little bit about it, so when Messiah will come and we'll see all these attributes, we'll go, aha, now I understand. So it's for the experience of the aha. This is why we learn uh, Hasidic thought. Anyways, so he said, let's go the Chabad way. Let's go the way of understanding. Not just, uh, not just the enthusiasm, but the cognitive, intellectual background that brings you to enthusiasm. That's what we got to put the emphasis on. on. So he really, really did some revolutionary uh, work. So he had a few, uh, I would say, in Hasidic thought, 
he has two major works. Uh, one of them is called the Tanya. Oh, sorry. One of them is called the Tanya. Uh, we'll get back to it in a second. Let us write it down. Tanya. The other is called Likute Torah. Or Torah, or it's just two parts. So this is this is on the Bible. Hasidic explanations on the Bible. This is Tanya is a, a whole set of ideas formed into a book on its own, uh, which basically has two major uh, themes. One is how does the soul work? It's like almost like Hasidic psych psychology. Uh, how does the soul work? Uh, what does it mean that uh, do we have different inclinations and how do we deal with these inclinations and what's the right way of serving God? Uh, taking into consideration our worldly inclinations and so on and so forth. Um, this is the first part of the Tanya and the second part, major part of the Tanya is about creation. How did God create the world and what is really the physical and spiritual existence that surrounds us? So those are the two major works of the, Basha, of, uh, the Rabbi Shneur Zalman. And this book, the Tanya, we even call it the Bible of Chabad Hasidism. It's almost like every topic that we're going to discuss, it has its source in the Tanya. So this is like the Bible of, Has of Chabad philosophy. The... Oops. I'm sorry for my terrible spelling. I don't spell, I don't write well I'm in English, so I make a mistake if I don't know. Uh, this is the Bible of Chabad philosophy. Now, Rabbi Schneer Zaman was very, very, very uh, certain about his way. And he, the Chabad stream of Hasidism became one of the most major streams of Hasidic uh, groups. And uh, we count seven generations for his dynasty. So seven, after him, there's another six rabbis, most of his children or, or grandchildren from one way or another. So that were followers of him in this way of teaching. So it was uh, Rabbi Schneer Zalman. Afterwards, it was his son, Rabbi Dovber, whose other name is the Mittele Rebbe, uh, uh, the in-between Rebbe. Why was he called in-between? Because after him, there was another Rebbe whose name was the Tzemach Tzedek, uh, based on the name of his book. Tzemach Tzedek, who was, whose name was Menachem Mendel, and he was a major Rebbe himself. And it was like, Schneur Zalman was the major rabbi, and his grandson was another major rabbi. In between was Rabbi Dovber, so it's the middle rabbi. Also, he was for a very short time. He was less than 20 years, he was a rabbi. But, so there was the Tzemach Tzedek. After the Tzemach Tzedek, there is Rabbi Shmuel, who was the rabbi Marash. After him was his son, the rabbi Rashab, Rabbi Sholem Dovber. Afterwards, he was his, his, his son, the rabbi Rayatz, the Yosef Yitzchak. Uh, and afterwards was... Rabbi Menachem Mendel, who was the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, whose picture you could see all over, which is just in general called the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He's named after the Tzemach Tzedek. So I just want to, I'm not going to, we're not going to go through all the whole dynasty, because that's a whole history class in itself. I just said this whole thing in order to place for you the author of the book that we're going to learn, so you know who he is and where he stands. So we have, we have Shneur Zalman. By the way, we spoke about his name. So Schneer, we mentioned, is two lights. Zalman is the Yiddish name for Shloime. So Shlomo, Zalman, is the same, is the same word, but it doesn't really matter. So, you know, like many Ashkenazi names, you have a Hebrew name, and there goes another uh, Yiddish name with it. For example, Dov, Ben, right? Dov means uh, beer, bear, and Ben means bear. So Hebrew, Yiddish. Then you have Menachem Mendel.
right? That's also a Hebrew name, and Mendel is the Yiddish name for Menachem. Now, Menachem Mendel was a third rabbi. His name, his other name, was Tzemach Tzemech. That's how we refer to him. Tzemach Tzemech. His book is called Tzemach Tzedek. Tzemach Tzedek means the righteous offspring. And it stands for the Messiah. And it's a book on actually halacha, on Jewish practice, not on philosophy. So he was a major rabbi in halacha and in philosophy, just like his grandfather, Rabbi Shneur Zalman. Uh, his um, children, he had many children. And when he, he, when he was the leader of this group, he really had probably close to 100,000 followers, which is a huge number, even today, but then especially. His children, uh, uniquely in the story of this dynasty, couldn't really figure out who's going to take him over. So it became a lot of groups. So at that time, you had a lot of Chabad groups, but only for one or two generations. It wasn't the major phenomenon. Just on a side note, we call this group Chabad, but we also call it Lubavitch. Why do we call it Lubavitch? Rabbi Shneer Zalman was a rabbi in Miozno and in Liadi. His son, though, moved to Lubavitch. Lubavitch is a really small town in White Russia. So from then on, till the, the sixth rabbi, uh, they all lived in Lubavitch. And that's why we call the other name for it is Lubavitch. Like many other Hasidic groups, which are named after the town where the rabbi or the dynasty lived. Actually, I would say probably Chabad is the only group which is not only named after the town where they live. It just has a name that has an identical meaning to, its, uh, uh, to the group itself. Anyways, so Rabbi Nachman Mendel had many children. One of his children was Shmuel, who, lay, who later, I mean, is considered the major follower of his. Or uh, uh, success, how do you say? Successor. successor of his. His name is Maharash. But he had other children as well. And uh, then it was his son and his son, Rashad, and uh, Rayat, and so on and so forth. And then, on a side note, there was other children and grandchildren from where the last Lubavitcher Rabbi Menachem Mendel came from. Right? Our Rabbi, the last one. And that's why he's called Benachem Mendel, because he's called after the Tzemach Tzedek. Let's just, this is on a side note. Now, the Tzemach Tzedek, who lived between 1789 and 16, and, and 1866, 1789 till 1866, was something special. He was really, really unique uh, rabbi, who was a major leader in the... Uh, Russian jury in general. And I would say, if we look at these Rebbes, so some of them were very special, but let's say they were more just a leader of their own group, right? Some of these rabbis were, their um, um, influence was way more than just their own group. So they had an influence, like for example, the grandfather, Shemar Zalman, he had a major influence on the whole jury of Eastern Europe. Same is true for the Tzemach Tzedek. Same is true for his grandson, the Rebbe Rashab. And the same is true for our Rebbe. Which I would say, they affected not only their own group, but world jury or the jury of, of, of Europe or Russia and so on and so forth. Now Tzemach Tzedek was very special in halacha. So he has major halachic works, works on Jewish practice. He was very special in Jewish activism. For example, the Tzemach Tzedek founded Jewish um, agriculture towns in Russia, which was very unique, right? And the Tzemach Tzedek was a major fighter for Jewish rights in the Russian army. Uh, he, was a, he was a major activist and he was a major philosopher. So he had all three. So you see like, uh, a huge Jewish leader, when in, in whatever age you look at, should have all, all, all of these three. Should be knowledgeable in halacha, should be knowledgeable in philosophy, and should not just be for his books. He should be a practical man 
an activist. So if you, look, for example, look at the Rambam, the Maimonides, he was also a major in philosophy, major in halacha, and he was also a down-to-earth person who was really active in... Uh, and you, throughout the ages, it's always the, the sign that you're speaking about a major leader. So the Tzemach Tzedek, and soon I'm going to give you a little break because we are, I'm speaking already for like an hour and a half. The Tzemach Tzedek, his, uh, he has many books, as I mentioned, but his major work, one of the most major works, which is studied till today in, re uh, in regula irregularity, uh, is called Derech Mitzvah Terech. Ways of your commandments. What is this? I'm just looking if you have it here in the library in the original Hebrew. You should have it because it's uh, one of the most essential Hasidic books. Here it is. This is the book in the original form. Not really the original because it was printed over, but uh, this is the book. What is this all about? So, Derech Mitzvotecha, as it is in its uh, um, name, is a book that is about the mitzvot, about the commandments of the Torah. Not all, but some major commandments. And the Tzemach Tzedek took these commandments and gave them a philosophical background. So, it was not about, for example, if there is a, let's give just a, you know, a list of, of a little bit of the what mitzvot, what commandments that it speaks about. So, for example, it speaks about the mitzvah of prayer. It doesn't mean that it's going to give you like practical, um, practical laws of how you're supposed to pray. It will deal with the question: What is the point of prayer? Is there a point of prayer? For example, if we say, just to give you one example, if we say that really everything is part of a godly plan, then what is the point of praying? I and mean, you cannot change that plan, so what's, why would you pray? Or if we say that uh, God decides on our fate at least once a year on Rosh Hashanah, that's a Jewish uh, tradition, then why should we pray? What is, what is prayer accomplished? Or we have, for example, one on circumcision. It's not going to speak about the practical uh, applications of circumcision, but it's going to speak about what is the inner meaning of the eighth day and why exactly on this part of our body and, and what is so all that philosophical or mystical background. So, and what we are going to learn today is one of the most deepest parts of this, uh, of, of, of this book. It's called, and called Mitzvat Hamanat Elokut. We'll write it in Hebrew. Mitzvat Hamanat Elohut, which is stands for the commandment of faith in God. Commandment of faith in God. Well, and this is um, I think it's something like thirty pages in the Hebrew. Well, actually less. Yeah, no, it's around thirty pages. Thirty pages in the Hebrew. And I must tell you, this is a part of the, when we, when I learned in a Chabad Yeshiva, so from the age of 13, 14 till the age of 20, we had twice a day, an hour and a half of Hasidic philosophy learning, where we would learn Hasidic texts. And uh, so that's three hours a day. We learned this uh, part of, and we didn't manage to finish, I think for over a half a year. So it's a really, really, really a deep part of, of, of this book and it tackles basically the most basic questions of faith. Faith, understanding, uh, godliness. It's a beautiful piece. I love it the most. And uh, I think everybody should try to learn it. Uh, and... Thank God we have an English translation of this. 
So what I did, I printed out the English translation. So you have it with you. We're going to learn from it. Please just pass it around. Everybody will get a copy. Uh, well, obviously, we just have two weeks, so we're not going to be able to uh, go through the whole thing. If I didn't manage to do it in a half a year uh, in the yeshiva, I'm not sure we're going to, or I'm sure we're not going to manage. Uh, we want two more, one more. How much more do we need? Oh, so it's exactly. We have, and I have a copy for myself. Then I guess we need to make one more because we have one more student, right? She didn't come now. Or, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll manage it. So anyways, we're going to uh, try to learn some of this. And I don't think we're going to be able to finish. But even if we just finish the first two, three sections, I think you will get a really good glimpse into uh, these ideas. Now, before I finish and before we get, go out for a little break and then come back to continue with the actual text and the actual topics that we're going to learn. I just want to say why I chose this and why I chose to learn in such a way. So I was thinking, how can I give you guys in a two week session, a real glimpse and a real taste into what Hasidic philosophy is. So at first I was thinking, well, let's try to, let's try to make a list of the major ideas of Hasidic thought and give each day another topic and collect some of the texts around it and give you a text to read at home. And then I thought to myself, well, it's not too smart because the way Hasidic philosophy is built is much less um, organized than other philosophical works, works, like secular philosophical works, right? And therefore, whichever text you're going to take, it's not just going to touch on one topic. It's, it's going to basically touch many, many topics. And therefore, I thought instead of trying to organize or reorganize these topics, the best is to take the original, we'll start learning it, and we will have a lot of topics that we'll be touching upon. And obviously, I will try to fill you in with all these topics. Uh, and that's the best way of trying to get a feel for all the topics that we want to touch upon. So that's why I chose to learn in such a way that we take one text and then why did I chose this one? Because I think this is, in a way, the most complex and in a way, most beautiful, one of the most beautiful texts of Hasidic thought. I just want to say that you should know that Chabad Hasidism has over 5,000 books. So it's a, it's, a, it's a school of thought that has over 5,000 printed books. Uh, just to give you a feeling of how much, how, mu how much material we are talking about. Uh, I really love learning Hasidic philosophy. Uh, for the past four years, I have a, what we call a chavrusa, which is a learning uh, 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 mate. Uh, every morning, we learn for an hour. And our goal was to learn all the teachings of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, who lived, who gave his, his thoughts for, who wrote down his, his uh, teachings for 37 years. Now, he was a Rebbe for, for 37 years. In my calculation, if we continue with the same pace we did for the past four years, it will take us over 10 years to finish all his teachings. And that this is just one out of seven. Uh, it's, it's a major, 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 major school of thought. It's not just, you're not speaking about one book. Like many people think, oh, it's the Tanya, you know, the Bible of, uh, of uh, Chabad thought. No, no, no. You're speaking about a huge, huge school of thought. And therefore, when we take now one piece and we give you a taste, it's really just a taste into like a drop of the sea. It's, it's, it's really just for you to get a glimpse into something major, something huge. So this was my introduction. Do you guys have any questions? Because I was like just talking, talking, talking. Maybe nobody was following what I was saying. Any questions? Especially now you guys have, we have, have these masks. I don't know. I just see your eyes. I don't see. You're smiling. You're happy. You're not happy. Yes. I, I, me, I just like, just like, I like to ask that, you know, the breast stuff. Right. You have a connection with them or you are... We are major bodies with breast lift. Sorry? We are major bodies with breast lift. Breast lift is a, a way of Hasidic yes. teachings, just like Chabad. Uh, but the interesting thing about Breslev is that Breslev had only one Rebbe, 
uh, Nachman, 250 years ago. And uh, he, was a, he was a student of the Baal Shem Tov. And he didn't have any su successor. And uh, still, it's an ongoing group, which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, convincing. If you have someone that his teachings are so uh, up to date from 250 years ago, it's pretty convincing. So it's a whole different type of, uh, of thought. He has his major uh, teachings. And it's a Hasidic group, but it's not Chabad. So it's, it's a thought into connection. itself. Well, a good, connection. good connection. I mean, we love all Jews. We have good connections with everyone. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we <laughs> think the same. Well, it's a, the topics are the same. So the, yes. the topics are, are all the same. It's not a, the topics don't change. So guys, we have a five, 10 minute break now and we will continue. I guess that uh, we can continue at 10.45, 10.50, just, you know, have a little 